In other parts of the globe, the doors to the world of information technology are being opened in a different way. South Africa's President Mbeki is famous for his addiction to the internet. He wants the country to follow suit, with the government pushing the adoption of the digital revolution. Even an entire television series has been devoted to open source software, and the government-funded Maraca Institute has spawned many open source projects, including the Digital Doorway, which its proponents say is a virtually indestructible computing hub, which follows the, if you build it, they will come philosophy. In India, uh, there was the idea of a hole in the wall project uh, where a computer would be put, uh, where people could access it uh, kind of off the wall. Uh, it's just sitting there and it peeps through the wall and the idea is to promote the concept of minimally invasive education. Uh, that has inspired South Africa's digital DOE project and it has now been rolled out across 21 sites. It's a way of making it easy for people to teach themselves at their own pace, again, according to their own style, uh, how to use and to innovate through information and communication technologies. The digital doorway is loaded with open source software, learning resources, an open source encyclopedia, digital books, graphic packages, and educational games. This computing kiosk, equipped with four protected screens and waterproof keyboards, not only provides access, but its supporters say quickly demystifies and makes accessible technology. Well, in many of the communities, you'll find that most of the community has not even discovered um, how a computer works. Uh, very few actually in the, in the very poor areas have access even to an ATM, let alone a computer that they can use. So for, for some of these places, this is actually the first experience any of the, the children especially have had. With, with a computer and so it's both an exciting opportunity for them to, to discover something new and also we find that in the long run they'll be learning um, about something that they're going to be using probably in, in jobs and in the workplace in the future so it, it is a real benefit to them. Projects like the Digital Doorway may be a step forward for the technologically impoverished communities but on the job front, especially in developed countries, commercial software is still much more prevalent in people's minds. I think you should have knowledge of Word, Excel. Word, Outlook. Microsoft Word and Excel. Explorer seems to be the most common. iMovie. I use the Microsoft Word more than anything else. It's definitely useful to have a knowledge of Word and Excel. I think it's important that anybody has a an understanding of that software because it's really the de facto software in the workplace nowadays. Frankly, that's really the only one that I know. <laughs> But that doesn't mean some of the big hitters are dismissing FOSS as software for the geeks. HP's position is very simple, that we give the customer a choice. If the customer wants to use proprietary software, we are very happy to give him that. And if the customer wants to use open source software, we give him that. And we work with the open source community in a very big way. In February 2005, computer giant IBM announced plans to invest 100 million US dollars in its support of open source software. Our commitment has increased to open source software. We're involved in over 150 open source projects. In our Linux Technology Center, we've got over 700 programmers and engineers working on open source projects as part of the open source community. But I think the main reason that our commitment to open source has increased is our customers have been asking for it because they see the value in it. And even though the majority of computers in the United Nations aren't running FOSS, the UN Joint Inspection Unit highly recommends its use. One of the recommendations we are making precisely is to ensure that all organisations in the UN system will come up with a organisation-wide policy on using open source software. This is no ordinary school bus in India. This bus's seats are equipped with a computer terminal and the ticket collector has been replaced by a technologically literate teacher. This is the mobile bus project in the Baramati district of central India, where scarce resources are being made to go further than ever before. The scheme is funded by the World Bank and the Vidya Pratishan's Institute of Information Technology, located in Baramati. The school children wait eagerly for the bus's arrival. The fleet of five buses travel to around 35 villages each week. 
are fully equipped with 24 computer terminals running free open source software, which the institute says was chosen because of initial cost savings. In India, basically, if we want to run the projects like mobile computer lab or giving computer education to rural school children, the basic constraint is the finance. And in order to get this, definitely we should find out how to reduce the cost of the project. And as the open source is the best solution to reduce the cost of the software, so we decided to go for open source platform. The mobile teachers are able to teach computing skills to 6,000 10 to 14 year old pupils. The mobile bus curriculum teaches everything from the basics of computing to how to use various kinds of software and even programming skills and it appears that this access is having even wider benefits. Apart from this computer education, their general knowledge has increased, their subject knowledge has increased, they, they have, interest gets generated so that they have started coming to schools. By being used in programs like this, proponents of FOSS say this is how it will help bridge the digital divide. Advocates of open source software as a boon for developing countries also contend it is highly flexible and sometimes best suited to help cope with large-scale issues like disasters. Natural disasters like the tsunami leave a massive scale of devastation in a very short space of time, swiftly wiping out transport, communications and emergency services infrastructures and even the richest nations are surprisingly left in a state of chaos. Over 30,000 people died and nearly a million people were affected by the tsunami in Sri Lanka and help and aid poured in from around the globe in the form of donations, food, clothes, money and people. All of this had to be coordinated in order that help effectively reached those who needed it most. And this needed to be done in an infrastructure that had received very little in terms of investment prior to the disaster. A vital part of disaster management is information. Who has been affected, where the people are, who needs help. And by accurately managing information using information technology, data can be processed enabling families and next of kin to find each other and resources to be distributed to those who need them most. The morning of the 26th of December was a terrible day for us uh, because uh, all of a sudden we faced, the whole of Sri Lanka faced something that had never been uh, the situation in Sri Lanka. We had losses of people, people who were not traceable, people who were injured, and, of course, for every one person, there was a whole family back at home looking for them and trying to find information. Looking at the urgent needs that had been created following the tsunami, the Sahana Disaster Management System was developed by a team of over 80 Sri Lankan programmers using free and open source software. After the tsunami, a group of volunteers from the IT industry, uh, really the free and open source community, got together and built a solution and a suite of web-based disaster management applications. They looked at the problems affecting their fellow countrymen and all the chaos, and they'd identify those problems and build solutions around them. FOSS worked for the improvised Sahana because the volunteer computer programmers needed the software urgently. It could sidestep red tape and download the products from the internet instantly without paying for anything. So Sahana claims that FOSS increases the agility of institutions working in disaster management. When we started on Sahana, we had no money as such to go and purchase off-the-shelf software. Uh, we also had a problem uh, that we needed to tailor make them. And then we had to get at, the, uh, get at something more than the commercial product. We need to go into it. With open source, all those problems were not there. So, a locally adapted disaster management system using free and open source software was built without needing to pay for license fees. The key advantage was having instant access to the source code. 